In the previous module, we saw two uh, uh, examples of simple procedural programming, and now we go on to discuss object-based programming. Now, before we start, I'd like to say a word of caution. Uh, beginning with this module, you're going to see some non-trivial uh, examples of uh, computer programs, of object-oriented uh, programming, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining what the programs are doing. And that is because this course is not about programming. It's about how programming languages are designed and implemented. And yet the best way to explain these design and implementation issues is to show many programming examples. Uh, so I think the contract between us should be such that uh, you should be willing to go with the flow, see my examples, without trying to understand every statement and knowing that you know whenever you want you can stop the video and look at the code uh, in depth although I recommend doing it only at the end of, uh, of the unit uh, so that the uh, sort of the flow of the presentation will not be uh, uh, impaired. So once again the code itself is not super important what's important are the principles that I will uh, uh, make sure to highlight everyone, every once in a while. All right, so uh, in the previous module, one thing that we said is that Jack has a very limited uh, uh, primitive type system. It has only three types and only one numeric type, which is int. Uh, in Java, we have, I think, five numeric types, and, uh, and yet we have only one. So it makes sense to extend the language with uh, uh, the ability to represent more uh, numeric types, for example, rational numbers. So it may be nice to uh, invent some uh, fraction abstraction that allows us to carry out uh, such operations as you see here uh, without loss of uh, accuracy so that everything will be uh, as correct as possible. So we can do this by uh, uh, introducing some uh, fraction API, as you see here. So what we see here is the skeleton of a class that uh, uh, provide, uh, that represents fractions and provides uh, a variety of uh, fraction-oriented uh, functionality. And uh, what this uh, uh, API lets us do is, first of all, you know, we can read the code. Uh, we can, uh, the code here is, of course, just uh, method signatures. So we have a constructor that allows us to uh, create uh, new fractions. We have um, uh, two accessors uh, that, that give, give us uh, access to uh, the numerator and denominator of the current uh, fraction. Uh, we have a, a plus uh, method that enables us to add up uh, fractions. We have a dispose method that uh, gets rid of the memory uh, resources that were allocated to this fraction. And we have a print method that uh, prints the method on the screen. Now, obviously, if you were to design such an API, you uh, may want to add more functionality, like uh, not only plus, but also minus, uh, multiply, uh, divide, uh, invert, uh, and so on. There are lots of things that you may want to do with fractions. And yet, once again, this is not a course about programming. And, uh, and yet, uh, and, you know, I'm going to give you enough information so that if you want, you can uh, implement all these additional functionalities uh, also. Once again, not necessarily for this course. All right, so how do you use this uh, uh, API? Well, uh, you need to write some uh, client code, and here's an example of some client code which exists in a separate uh, Jack class. And uh, this uh, uh, program here seeks to add up two-thirds and one-fifth, and it does it uh, as follows. First of all, it creates uh, three pointer uh, variables or reference variables or object variables. Uh, any one of these terms is uh, correct, A, B, and C of type fraction. And then it uh, creates uh, two fractions, A and B. Uh, A points to the fraction uh, 2 uh, and 3, the fraction characterized by 2 and 3, and B points to the fraction characterized by 1 and 5. And then we do A plus B. We print the result and we uh, uh, return. So uh, at the end of the story, when we execute this program, we're going to get uh, 13 over 15, which hopefully is the sum of uh, 2 thirds and 1 fifth. 
What I'd like to do next is uh, uh, focus on every one of the activities that we did here uh, in some detail. So we'll talk about object construction, we'll talk about uh, uh, methods that manipulate the current object, and uh, uh, we'll talk about object uh, destruction. But before we get into these uh, detailed explanations, I'd like to make a general uh, comment. And the comment is that uh, here, once again, we meet the uh, uh, super important abstraction implementation uh, principle, which we emphasize uh, throughout this course. Notice that users of the fraction abstraction need to know absolutely nothing about how the fractions are actually implemented. They view the fraction as a black box abstraction, and they just use the services of this abstraction as uh, uh, advertised in the abstractions API, and that's perfectly okay. That's how you know we use abstractions uh, in in uh, high level uh, programming, and yet at some point someone has to implement this abstraction. This someone may be you at a different stage of the project. It may be another programmer who works in the same uh, team together with you, or it may be you know someone in another company that uh, was uh, hired in order to develop this, uh, uh, this abstraction. So uh, let us now you know, take off the hat of the application programmer that writes uh, uh, the client code and uh, put on uh, the cap of the um, uh, abstraction uh, implementer, in the, the person who, is, uh, 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 who has to actually build the fraction abstraction and realize, uh, realize it in, uh, in Jack. So let's do that. The first thing that you have to ask yourself when you design an abstraction is um, what kind of data do we want to store about uh, uh, the objects that uh, this class is supposed to represent? Well, in the case of fractions, we need two pieces of data, which is the numerator and the denominator. And we store these values in two integer typed uh, fields. And these fields are akin to uh, what Java calls uh, member variables and what uh, C Sharp calls uh, 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 properties. You know, these are simply variables that describe the uh, data elements of, uh, of the objects or the instances of this class. Okay, moving along, I show you here two accessors that I wrote in order to facilitate access to, uh, to these uh, field values, to the values of the current uh, object. Now, this is common uh, programming practice in object-oriented programming, but in Jack, it's absolutely necessary because the only way to access field values from outside the class is through accessor methods. So let me give you an example where uh, uh, this uh, principle comes to play. Suppose you want to create the fraction uh, 5 uh, over 17, and you want to access the numerator of this fraction. Well, in uh, a language like Java, you could have done this. You know, if, um, if the member variable that represents numerator and denominator were, were public, you could have uh, done x dot numerator and get the value of this field. But in Jack, uh, this kind of access is disallowed, and the only way uh, uh, to achieve the same purpose is to go through uh, an accessor method, which is good programming practice anyway. Uh, so uh, uh, that's how we do things uh, in Jack. All right, uh, moving along, let us assume that uh, we, uh, we, we designed these two accessors. They are in the class. I'm, I'm not showing them because I don't have enough space on each slide. So everything that we discussed before in previous slides you know, is already part of the class. The next part of the class is going to be a constructor, you know, uh, a method whose, uh, 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 which is designed to create new objects. Well, this constructor receives uh, two uh, uh, inputs, uh, two parameters, x and y, and it goes on to uh, populate the numerator and denominator of the current object with the values of x and y. Then it uh, reduces the fraction, which is important in case the fraction is something like uh, 8 over 16. You know, we want to reduce it to 1 half. And finally, it returns uh, the base address to this uh, object uh, fraction, which was just uh, created. Now, uh, the reduce uh, method is a typical method. Uh, 
that uh, operates on the, um, on the uh, fields of the current object. In this case, it uh, uh, reduces uh, the friction by uh, using a function call called uh, GCD. And finally, we have this function uh, GCD, which computes the greatest uh, common denominator. You know, going back to reduce, once you compute the greatest common denominator of the numerator and the denominator, you can divide both by the GCD and get uh, the reduced uh, fraction. So here is the code of GCD, which is a classical implementation of uh, Euclid's uh, algorithm. And with that, I kind of uh, like this slide because it shows you all the possible subroutines that are available in Jack. And these subroutines are methods, constructors, and functions. Methods are designed to operate on the current object. Constructors are designed to create uh, new objects uh, which are instances of the current class. And functions are methods that operate on no object in particular. These are equivalent to static methods in uh, Java. Uh, a few more things that we see here is, first of all, the keyword this, which is a standard reference to the current object. Internally, it's actually a memory address. It's the base address of the current object uh, in the host RAM. And uh, one of the rules of the game is that a Jack constructor must return the base address or must return an object of the type of the uh, surrounding uh, class, or the class to which uh, this constructor uh, belongs. Now, Java constructors do exactly the same, but, but they do it implicitly. You, know, you don't have to say return this in Java, but actually, believe me, this is what the constructor actually does after it uh, follows a compilation. All right, another thing that we see here in this example is that a Jack subroutine must always terminate with a return command. You know, it doesn't matter uh, uh, if, if it returns a value or not, you must have a return. Once again, in Java, there's no need to return explicitly, but once again, believe me, Java methods always return implicitly using some code that the compiler uh, injected into the, uh, uh, into the translated uh, VM code. All right, uh, moving along, uh, let us uh, uh, take a, a look at this method, plus. Uh, this method uh, simply adds up the current object and uh, the other object, the object that was passed to it as a, a parameter. And the addition is based on uh, elementary school uh, mathematics, which I'm not going to dwell on. Uh, so this is an example of a typical method operating on fractions. And you could, you could have written, if you want, many more such methods to do minus, multiply, uh, divide, uh, invert, and so on. All right. Um, the next thing that I want to explore is the print method, which uh, prints uh, the current uh, object on the screen. Of course, we don't know what is the current object, so 13 over 15 is just an example. You know, whatever object you will give this method, it will print, uh, print it in this uh, nice uh, format. And uh, the logic is trivial. It prints the numerator, it prints a uh, slash, it uh, prints a denominator, and that's it. Uh, I'm putting two statements in the same line uh, in order to uh, save uh, slide space in other slides, so don't worry about it. And of course, once again, I can add more uh, fraction uh, methods here if I want. And the last method that I want to discuss is dispose, which is necessary in order to, uh, uh, to be a good citizen and uh, free up uh, the uh, resources held by a fraction when you no longer need it. Uh, you, uh, I'm talking to the application programmer who uses the services of, uh, of the fraction class. So the dispose method uh, is uh, implemented using a call to the host operating system. And in particular, we call an OS routine called dialloc, which takes an address in memory and uh, disposes the, uh, uh, the memory block that begins in this address uh, in order to represent the current object. So once we pass this to dialloc, we are guaranteed that the memory res resources that, that were held by, uh, uh, by the current object will be freed uh, for future use of our computer system. And uh, 
This is uh, necessary in JEC because JEC has no garbage collection uh, services like you know, other languages uh, may have. And therefore, it is up to the programmer or it is up to the uh, class architect to make sure that uh, he or she uh, uh, includes a dispose method in every class that represents an object so that application programmers will be able to, uh, to use it uh, in order to, uh, to get rid of uh, objects that are no longer necessary. Now, the next thing that I'd like to uh, explore is how objects are really represented uh, in memory and uh, the difference between the programmer's view of the project and uh, of the object and the system's view uh, of the object. So, you know, so far uh, we uh, took the roles of an application programmer and uh, we then took the role of uh, the class developer. Now we'll take the role of, uh, of a plumber that really goes, you know, inside the pipes and uh, uh, trying to understand how things really work uh, under the hood. All right, so um, I repeat here the constructor code that uh, we saw earlier, nothing new here, and uh, some client code that uh, uses uh, uh, the constructor by calling it uh, twice. And programmers tend to think about objects using this uh, visual representation here. So we see that uh, each fraction is represented by a block that includes all the, um, uh, the field values of the current uh, object. And we also have a reference to each, uh, each of these blocks, which is the name of the variable that we uh, created in order to, to represent these fractions. So after running the client code, we get in the programmer's mind, uh, or using some documentation tool, we will get uh, these two uh, abstract descriptions of, um, of uh, the objects that we created. Now, how is it really implemented, you know, under the hood? Well, here is how it really uh, is uh, implemented. We see the host RAM. We see that the RAM, uh, uh, some area of the RAM is de designated to represent the stack of the currently running uh, application. And this is the working stack, you know, that includes everything, the variables, the uh, memory segments, and so on, of all the, all the methods up the uh, calling chain. Um, we have the heap, where we, where we represent uh, objects and, uh, and arrays. We see that we have a variable called uh, A, which uh, contains the number 15087. If we treat this variable as a pointer and we look up this address in the RAM, we see the number 2. If we look at the next word in the RAM, we see the number 3. And these two numbers are, uh, comprise the memory block that represents our first object. The, uh, the object, uh, well, first or second, doesn't matter, two, uh, 2 over 3. And then if we look at the B variable, we see that it contains the address uh, 4112. If we look up this address, we get the same story. OK, so this is the real representation of, uh, of these objects in, in the host RAM. All the addresses are contrived. I made them up. And uh, they are not important, obviously, for uh, our discussion. Now, there's some interesting issues here. And uh, uh, the first one is, uh, how does this happen? You know, how does uh, this representation, uh, how is it established? Well, the secret uh, is that when the compiler is going to compile your constructor, it will inject some calls to the uh, operating system. And these calls are going to find available memory and allocate it to the uh, object that was just uh, uh, constructed. So as you will see later on in the course, uh, the, the compiler cooperates with the, with the host OS in order to deliver this uh, functionality that we see here. Which raises you know, some more issues like, um, well, how do we know, how does the OS know how to allocate memory? How does the OS know how to deallocate memory when it is no longer uh, necessary? Well, these are high questions. and. Um, we will deal with them in the most uh, elegant and uh, satisfying way uh, later on in the course. So stay tuned until we, we get to discuss them. Now, I'd like to end this unit with a general observation about Jack. And uh, you know, if we can sort of look back at what we did, we wrote a class called uh, Fraction. And uh, what you see here is the entire code of this class. It consists of uh, sort of like one page of code. 
um, a quarter of which is, uh, is comments and, uh, and white space. And uh, you know, this goes to show you the tremendous expressive power of uh, object-based programming in general and the Jack language uh, in particular. We got a lot of functionality uh, in, uh, with very little code. Uh, in the uh, next units, we'll continue to show you some more examples of uh, elegant uh, object-based programming. And as usual, the purpose is not to talk too much about the programming, but rather to talk about uh, the language and its uh, supporting uh, uh, infrastructure.